and uh, I'll review that for you for a few minutes. <clears throat> he received his Bachelor of Architecture degree with honors from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He also received there the following year a diploma in urban valuation and several years later came to this country and studied at the University of Illinois where he received his master's degree. He has uh, very numerous experiences working as a professional, as an architect. He's done some consulting work or practice in New Zealand, the Fiji Islands, Italy, and in New York City. He, as well, besides his professional endeavors, has been involved in teaching for a number of years and has taught both at the University of Illinois following his uh, okay. receiving his master's degree and also has spent uh, four years teaching at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Last year he began a series of lectures and tours around the country talking about both uh, the Italian hill towns that you will, and the Mediterranean hill towns that you will see tonight and in addition, addressing a larger issue, um, an article on this has just been published recently. It's called Designing in an Ecosystem. He uh, also has interest in the history of culture, and he has worked for a couple years during the summer months in between his teaching endeavors in Turkey and in Sicily on archaeological digs. Furthermore, he's been a consultant on special projects, namely the, the uh, care of the severely and profoundly retarded, uh, the design of their environment, and uh, has worked both in London and in Cleveland, Ohio, in that capacity. So you can see from that list of uh, honors and uh, the diversity of the list that he's, he's a man of a considerable background. He uh, will be here for the next 10 weeks working in the fourth year and uh, probably will be giving several other lectures uh, either to the uh, large groups such as this or perhaps uh, to individual studios. Uh, I think we're quite fortunate to have him here tonight to give us a lecture on Mediterranean hill towns, Mr. Neil McIndoe. Thank you, Bob, for your welcome. Uh, can you hear me all right up there? That's OK, fine. And thank you, everybody, for your welcome. It's a delight to be here at Ball State. I've been looking forward to it now for a number of weeks. Uh, and I'm very much taken by the, the handsome building, the very congenial atmosphere amongst my colleagues and amongst the students that I've met so far. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, participating in other classes, as well as what I hope will be a great success in the fourth year studio, where we'll be tackling those ecological problems that Bob mentioned. Uh, and we're doing so in the framework of a village, which kind of a, a connection with the things I'll be talking about tonight. The Mediterranean hill towns, perhaps known to some of you already, as a, a feature in terms of the form that man has given to his urban environment, uh, was first presented to me in an architecture course when I was doing my undergraduate degree as being these most curious and delightful and almost uh, primitive forms and very compelling in that respect. Holding my attention, I sought them out when I went to Italy some years later to work in archaeology and not only did I find that the forms were indeed as delightful as they seem, but I found another most important thing. You find it difficult to hear it? Is it dead in the back there? Can you turn it off a bit, Tom, perhaps? And that was uh, working in Sicily on the uh, dig. Most of our workers came from a village, and we, in fact, lived very close to the village. And that meant that I had the opportunity to experience this kind of urban life as a very vital and meaningful thing in the 20th century, as well as being a rather delightful study in history. Yes? It's on. Um, how does that sound? 
That's better? Okay. In giving further attention to the hill towns, I find that not only am I looking at a, a vital community of the 20th century, but I begin to understand something about the basic traits of community in general. And those I would summarize as three. First, gathering, the tendency of people to want to come together. The second is organization, coming together as a group. You have a, a necessity to organize, and most societies like to organize to some degree. Thirdly, is the very strong tendency to want to make things significant, give significance to events and to physical forms which surround events. And there's a fourth basic sensibility there, which to me has to do with how we experience physical form. And these forms are somewhat primitive, somewhat primeval, and in that they present something very sensual, I think, in the way of, of experience, of visual and physical experience. Now, the nature of community. In the gathering process, people come together because they want to exchange ideas and to exchange goods. They come together for the mutual advantage of, of helping each other, especially in matters of defense. They come together for gregariousness, just the enjoyment of being with other people. And they come together to affect leadership and common direction. Significance is given to festivals, both community festivals, such as the harvest, individual festivals, such as the basic four which occur in all societies, that of birth, adulthood, marriage, and death. They give significance to roles in communities, such as the leaders, wealth, and social position. And they give significance to basic needs, such as the necessity for water, for the sustenance of a community. Now, a village may continue to grow following these basic patterns which are essentially agrarian in their economy, or it may have within it the seeds of something which leads it to be more urban in its lifestyle, something which we would call a town. And those seeds would grow out of the basic ideas, uh, from the idea of organization and leadership. And leadership, when it becomes authority, can make a town an urban center. The authority on the one hand of the church or the spiritual authority, on the other hand, the earthly authority, which may be that of a, a wealthy family, an influential family, a group of families, or it could be of some form of democracy, even in the medieval period. The, the notion of mutual advantage, of exchange, when, when that grows, it becomes either a marketplace or a university, in the case of exchange of ideas, or, or a monastery, again, exchange of ideas. And once more, that's a seed of, of urban community. There are also special kinds of seeds. One would be uh, a miracle within the church. Uh, such events have been made certain places desirous for pilgrimages, uh, holy events, and around them have grown towns. Another special case would be where a town grew from out of the medieval period from an ancient foundation which had occurred from Roman or Greek times. And as medieval urbanism grew around these seeds beginning in the ninth century, it had before it some precedent, beginning first of all with Greek civilization a precedent especially in the terms of the use of a community open space within the town. Uh, for the Greeks, this was the agora, a place where in which people gathered and a place around which institutions grew up and took form and shape and became uh, eventually, through trial and error, uh, strong elements in the urban lifestyle. This tradition was maintained by the Romans. They tended to repeat much the same thing, adding some institutions of their own. And even with the decline of the Roman Empire, many towns continued to survive, if in a lesser, lesser fashion, and certainly the invading tribes from the Germanic North were not unaware of the benefits and the appeal of civilized life, and they tended to maintain them where they could.
In studying the hill towns, I also came to another general realization, and that was that I was studying more the notion of compact communities than specifically hill towns. And so I wanted to come to understand what is what's the advantage of being in a compact community. And I'm trying to look at these things in these very general ways, by only, because only by abstracting the generality can I also make the transfer to the 20th century of what we can learn from them, as well as delighting in, a, in an object of the past. Because when we look at objects of the past, we also get bound up with expectations about the past. And the abstraction helps us to get away from that. And in the latter part of the lecture, I want to present to you a number of instances where architects have benefited from these kinds of studies, uh, from looking at these kinds of communities, and also situations in which I think we all can benefit in the future. Well, compactness. Compactness for the social reasons I spoke of, for defense, uh, being very close together, you can uh, work your defense techniques much more readily. Energy. Now, a compact community is a low energy community because the lines of communication are relatively uh, close together. Agriculture. If you're compact, you're going to conserve the best land for for cultivation and for pastoral use. And fifthly, culture or religion. During the Middle Ages, the sense of Christianity was that nature or the countryside was a setting of the devil, of temptation. And because the life, life on earth was con conceived of as a life uh, in which one extolled oneself for the purpose of the life hereafter, then this was seen to take place within the urban setting and that the uh, rural setting was antithetical to the Christian lifestyle. And so medieval communities tend to be very introspective because of that, are very much a huddling together. Now, if we take that compact form and then move it to a hilltop and place it on the hilltop, we find that many of those reasons for compactness are reinforced and some other ones are added. The defense, of course, is reinforced. Some of these hilltop uh, situations are spectacularly inaccessible. Others may just have gentle slopes to them, but nevertheless, they would be sufficient to uh, counter the deployment of medieval warfare machinery. Health. On a hilltop, you get better ventilation. If it's a southern slope, as it often is, you'll get better sunlight. And certainly in the medieval period, the valleys became swamps with the fall of the Roman Empire and its control and uh, irrigation systems, the valleys did become swamps and therefore very unhealthy. And in fact, uh, many parts of central Italy were infested with malaria right up until the beginning of the 20th century. Surveillance. If a town was on the coast, the people from a high position could see out to sea and observe the weather patterns. And because their economy depended on fishing, this was of advantage to them. It's an interesting thing that on a coast, you very often had the development of a pair of villages, one on top of a hill and the other at the foot of the hill, where it could put out to sea very readily. And the, they would have the same name, only distinguished by the suffix or prefix, uh, high or low. If on the other hand, the town was inland, the, the surveillance would provide the opportunity to watch, observe a change in color of crops and see when they come closest to harvest and then go to the fields and harvest them. A final reason is symbolic, and that is that the form of the town can be exploited in the location of forms of great significance, and notably those are the ones of leadership, the church and the major family or the town hall. And these are the slides that I'll, I will begin with, showing the symbolic relationship and also showing the relationship of all urban form to the natural form, a topographic series of topographical relationships. Any the lights, please? You can turn out the, or do I turn this out? I do. And you can turn this overhead one off, too. I'll just ad hoc it as I go. It's more fun. This town is in southern Italy. It's, 
As you see, it occupies a very strategic relationship in the valley, strategic for com any communications moving along that valley, and it also is clear of the best agricultural land, which you see is fairly wealthy in its fields and its, and its olive groves. And of course, up on the right, you see what I was talking about, how those two major buildings, the church on the left and the uh, nobleman's house on the right, how they dominate the town through exploiting the land form itself. And this form, which is generally fairly concentric or around the cone, perhaps with a bias to one side, I would call a, a cone relationship. And schematically, we can sum that up like that. The rows coming to the top and between the major buildings would be an open space, a piazza, for people to gather in. The second basic form is linear, and this town in central Italy, to the east of Rome and the hills there, is, you see, a very clear spine form. It is not fortified. A town cannot always afford to have a wall, but it would nevertheless ensure that its perimeter ring of houses would remain contiguous and therefore presented the best line of defense. Again, we summarize it like that, and the piazza would ap appear in the middle of, of that spine road. Now let's take a look inside this town. First of all, entering the gateway at the base of that spine road, moving up, unfolding into the space, and here we are at the, at the top of the spine, the piazza would open off to the left. Just more examples of these two basic topographical types. This town, Caprarola, still in central Italy, is famous for the Villa Farnese, which is at the top here. It was designed by Vignola in 1547, and it occurs in your Bannister Fletcher, for those who study history. You see it built alongside a major church, and then the rest of the town running down the spine in this case, running b beneath the, the main house, the, the main institutions, uh, almost in the, uh, a metaphorical statement of the, uh, the peasants being at the feet of their feudal lord. It was common enough that these two were built together, both of them exploiting the landform, both of them exploiting each other in the sense of identifying with each other in terms of their power but also, I think, keeping an eye on each other, a, a, a basic sense of checks and balances. Staying with central Italy, I think this scenario projector here is a little, or can I do it from here? Yeah, there we are, that's better. How's the other one? Subiaco here. Again, the fortified residence at the top, you see the same in the cone form on the right-hand side, the fortified structure at the top. And towns as they were de depicted in the time. This uh, early 16th century painting and the other a, very, a late 15th century painting. Th these towns were not the subjects of paintings in those days, but they were it did, however, occur in the background. A very clear spine form there, and on the right, a different topographical relationship. Here, the topography is so grand that the town is not going to dominate it. And so it spreads down the face of this mountainous valley. And the valley runs for about 20 kilometers, and there are about four towns on the, the valley, but they all occupy the same face. And that's because it has the best orientation to the sun. Two very clear examples of the notion of conserving the best land for agricultural use. On the right here, too, you can see the, where the the stone has been quarried out of which the town is made. And typically these towns are made from the very material on which they stand. And if that isn't stone, it, it will be clay and it can be turned into mud bricks.
this relationship of the form with the nature was very much uh, a strong topic in the mind of some painters in the early parts of the modern movement. On the right is a painting by Cezanne. Now, Cezanne was from Provence in the south of France and from villages which fringe the Mediterranean. So they were very much a part of his own experience. But even more than that, he was interested in forms and uh, visual experiences which had a very enduring character, a very strong sense of reality without the mediation of, of psychological expectation, the mediation of uh, different kinds of viewpoints, but very enduring uh, visual experiences. And he, he found in these towns, which were his, his birthright, that kind of, of object which he used as the subject of his paintings. And Cezanne provided the, well, first of all, on the, on the right, that's a painting by Duran, which is much more uh, classically composed, much more at rest. But two more, and he, Duran was following from Cezanne, but two other painters who contributed much more to the modern movement, also picking up on Cezanne, not only in his techniques, but and his uh, philosophy, ideas, but also on the subjects that he used. And on the left is Braque, and on the right is Picasso. Now, both of these paintings are paintings I've lost the dates. I think they're between 1908 and 1911. And this is the period when those two painters independently were developing the basic tenets of the modern movement, the basic tenets, rather, of, of analytical cubism. And both of them followed Cezanne. Both of them admired his sense of con looking for form, constructive forms within nature and within man. And in trying to get out what they felt, about form, they were using the kinds of subjects which helped them, subjects which had this very insistent kinds of quality, very insistent reality. And once they had gone through this stage and moved further into Cubism, they didn't paint these scenes anymore. But they were, in a way, the kind of gateway to Cubism. This town in southern Italy is it's the same town in both photographs. Uh, you see it occupies a tributary valley to the main valley. <clears throat> and because that relationship makes quite a lot of sense, it has a stream running down through it, it has control of the valley behind, then so you see a second town on the left-hand side in the distance occupying a very similar relationship. Now, down this valley in antiquity ran the Via Appia, famous Roman road, and the Romans would maintain their, their hold over the countryside and their communication systems by locating military towns the distance apart that a legion would march in one day. And those towns, by their military strength and their organizational strength and bureaucracies, which then maintained and built the irrigation systems, brought both the natural setting of the valley and also the uh, dissident uh, indigenous peoples into, in, under their control. But what happened with the fall of the empire, and this is one of those, this is a town about uh, 10 kilometers further down the valley, a military town, with the fall of the empire, these villages, these small military towns, no longer became uh, safe places. The military control had dropped away, the, the indigenous people became rebellious, uh, and also because the irrigation systems had fell into disuse, the valleys became swamps and uh, unhealthy. And so the people were took, took to the hills. But when they did so, they, they moved as a community. They took their continu as a continuity of community there. For this town is called Sapinum, the Latin name Sapinum, and the a village on the hill a mere five kilometers away today is called in Italian Sapino. And you see in the names the continuity of community. It's interesting to see that here uh, there is not a village but a, a hamlet, a few uh, farmhouses, and how they relate to the old structure. Rather curious that this here is a series of dwellings in one structure. It is curved, and you see it again there, because it, it fills two-thirds of the circle of the old amphitheater. It's not a very well-known site, and so it's not hard for one to take a drive in the forum. Uh, on the right, you see an early use of recycling of uh, temple columns. 
And while we're talking about precedent, this is Morgantina, the town that I worked on in Greece. Uh, sorry, in Sicily. It's a Greek city. It's in the mountains. It has a, a lovely sense of how the open space was created, the agora, but created in a way which fits with the landscape. The agora is situated in a valley, or rather in a gully, and the gully floor is dropping away towards the edge where the mountains are in the background. So that change in level is, is coped with by creating an upper agora and a lower agora, and the junction being this magnificent urban staircase which sweeps right across the gully. Also up in this corner here is the uh, theater. It's interesting that the Greeks always cited their theaters with magnificent views behind them. Perhaps when the, uh, the quality of the stage production wasn't so good, they could just uh, wistfully gaze out into the Blue Mountains. But this, as I say, it is typical what happens, uh, for instance, in this town, which is Praini, in, uh, which is now the uh, west coast of Turkey, this town, despite its very dramatic sighting, has a strict gridiron plan, the Hippodamian plan, which has a quite a neat tension between the dramatic landform, but yet the re strict regularity of the man-made city form. Uh, the Greeks favored the hill sites because of the notion of defense. Remember, they weren't an empire, but rather a series of city-states, sometimes in league with each other and sometimes not and so they needed autonomy in defense. They also enjoyed them aesthetically you know, for the reasons of citing the theaters the way they did. And now to the 20th century. I want to take you inside this town and show you how it's used as a setting for human events. This is near Tivoli, in the center of Italy. You see straight away that it follows the basic pattern of the topographical, of the uh, conical shape and the two institutions surmounting it. This is a cherry festival, and as such, it's a variation on the harvest festival, one of the most predominant of pagan festivals which have been passed down to us in different guises uh, to the 20th century. And what we see here is how the urban setting becomes the stage, the urban stage for this uh, human celebration. And this is that notion of significance, that it, that it creates that place for an event of significance. And it does so, so reinforcing, you see these people on the right here, higher, where two streets come in at different levels, and so they provide an almost natural grandstand. The piazza itself is barely more than the widening of a street, but yet it's sufficient, and a very sufficient, though simple gesture in which this event can take place. And so they had the village band, this group of flag throwers came from a nearby village. They toss their flags in the air and catch them, or maybe their partner catches them in either these lines or in a circle. But to me, what is more significant about this, and more important, is not the particular event, but in a way it's an intensification of something which happens in, typically in Spain and, and Italy every day. And that is that it is the habit when people come home from work before they have dinner, which tends to be late, maybe nine or 10 in the evening, that they will take a walk in the street, and t especially to the piazza. And in doing so, they'll come without arrangement upon their friends, stop and share the, the latest in the, in the town gossip, exchange some news, get down to some business, some ideas, uh, have a glass of wine. And this pattern, the making the, the trip around the town, they call the paseo or the passeggiata, uh, it is a very daily occurrence and, a very, and very much provided for by the physical fabric of the town itself. Two medieval settings of, of towns. And while we're looking at the, the, the late medieval or early Renaissance painting, it's interesting that many of the modern painters that I spoke of earlier were much in admiration of the strong simplicity of forms that these painters managed to uh, accomplish. Uh, neither of these are by Giotto or Fra Angelico, but they were two painters who, who uh, were often mentioned by the mo early modernists. And it's interesting too, I think, when you, th uh, you uh, 
often read of the relationship between, say, ideas like perspective, bringing the, the uh, modeling of space and mass into a set of rules, and that this was a big breakthrough in painting. I'm, personally, I'm not quite that convinced about it. I think that things non-perspectival -pers were done very deliberately to make these forms very primeval in one's visual experience of them. And for example, if you take this painting here, this cornice line up the top here, much, okay, up there, I hope you can see. You see how that swung very, very much out of the perspective and everything else very neatly converges. The guy was ordering those things very well. And I think it makes that surface twist towards us and makes it very powerful in our experience. And I think that's a very deliberate and conscious thing that he's doing. Now I want to take you through a study in detail. This is San Gimignano in Tuscany. In a review of Kahn's Richard's Medical Center, a critic made the analogy between his medieval handling of the form, namely the towers of that building at, at the University of Pennsylvania, and the, the modeling of towers at San Gimignano. Well, irrespective of a somewhat tenuous connection there, these, these towers manifest the need for defense. And all of this is really an exploration in what does the urban form manifest in terms of human behavior, especially the processes of community formation. And here we see the manifestation of defense, not to a threat from without, but rather to factionalism within. Remember I talked about the two forms of leadership, the spiritual and the, and the earthly. And they were very much in competition. They were keeping an eye on each other, and, they, and at times they competed against each other. And in a particular period, they were the uh, supremacy of one or the other was hotly disputed. In this period, the division between the Guelphs and the Guillabines split many towns. And this San Gimignano, in the, as, and it happens in other towns, but this is the most spectacular. There were originally 70 of these towers. But what they did was that the leading families, the wealthy merchant families, built an annex to their house, a fortified annex, which was the tower, from which they could observe each other and from which they could toss a spot of boiling oil on anybody who they thought was getting out of line. Uh, you don't need to build that high to, throw your to get a good aim for your boiling lead or oil. And in fact, many of these towers were, bit, were continued to be built after the period of, of factionalism had, been, had passed. And they were, because of this sense of significance, man wanting to uh, symbolize things which are important to him. And in fact, these people were kind of in a competition to see who could outbuild the Giovannis next door. Now we come inside the town. At the top of the hill is the Piazza complex. There are three, but we can take the two most important ones. Let me just get this. There we go. This one, first of all, which focuses the main institutions, the cathedral here, the bishop's palace there, the town hall there, and the mayor's residence there. The second one focuses the houses of the leading families of the town, and in the middle is as well. And notice that the two piazzas overlap on this common quarter, corner, further articulated by a portico. Now, having said all that, and clued you into what that plan represents, now forget what I said. And now look at it not so much as a plan denoting specific kinds of buildings, but rather as, a, as an arrangement of lines, a, a kind of configuration. A configuration that one could characterize by words such as informal, irregular, agglomeration, or incremental. Incremental is a word I particularly like. Now what are the reasons for that? There are several forces involved. First of all, the, the shape of the land itself. And this street here, and that one there, and that one there, you see revealed the three spurs which come together in a very typical way to form the ridge. The town had a wall, and that limited the safe urban land and, and created a force from without, a compression. And then a, there was another force from within. And that was, this was a market town, and a market economy and all its uh, vitality prevailed. And the demand for urban space inside the town grew with its wealth and so that these crucial positions of interchange where people met on the crossroads then wanted to become bigger 
and if houses built, burnt down or there was an edict passed, the line of buildings could be moved back. And you see that force revealed in that line there. Now, this, take this photograph here, which occurs right up on this road here. And looking at the plan, looking at the photograph, try and imagine yourself in that space. And uh, does it feel claustrophobic to you? I think it sometimes does to American audiences who are used to wider spaces. <clears throat> and then try and imagine what it would be like to come into this piazza. And we'll move towards that. We're on the same street looking through the arch from the other side, up towards the piazza. And here's a similar characteristic we saw before of the urban space. The road twisting away from it as it curves towards the piazza. And as it twists away, it, it closes the space and makes it much the size that we can experience uh, by our human figure, our human scale or pedestrian scale, They're very much always tangible to the human size. But it, but it not only closes, but it also establishes sequence. It establishes sequence and closure at the same time because it suggests, with a play of light along the wall, it suggests the events and the spaces to come further beyond. This sense of, of partial view, of unfolding view, can also be given in keynotes like this, also approaches to that same piazza. And we come into the piazza itself, not a particularly big space, most of them are, they're fairly intimate, spaces whose major dimension seldom exceeds the one at which you can recognize the person or the facial expressions of somebody on the other side, about 60 or 70 feet, uh, sometimes up to about 100 feet. Now here, just to pinpoint those buildings for you again, you see the, the west front of the cathedral there, unfinished, up the ramp to the side and through there is the bishop's palace. This other photograph from the top of those steps, you see here being restored the mayor's residence, I call it as an approximation, and here this portico leading to the other piazza is that of the town hall. Looking up that ramp into the bishop's palace and inside the church, And back outside, we're moving towards that portico, getting that, a partial view of that larger event beyond. And inside, looking back, and you see there the, the piazza we just came from. And take a look at the well. It's a fairly substantial structure, and it was once quite well ornamented. And the well is quite simply the provision of water, and that's basic to the survival of the community. And here you see that basic necessity given very strong form and being ornamented with some wealth, some expenditure, because of its significance to the community. Still on the piazza, I want to talk now about the, the shape of this space and, and the shape, especially of the surfaces forming this space. Now let's begin with the floor. This is the city floor. You notice its curvature. It's curved because that is the shape of the hill before the town developed on it. Notice also that other than the well, there are no other, there are no permanent objects on it. It's an undifferentiated surface, just the texture of the paving itself. And that has a very strong effect. It means that objects standing on it, on this undifferentiated surface, what you could call, quite readily call the common ground, any object standing on it is on a common place to you. It means that you're brought in a very close relationship with them. That, that my, for instance, standing there, looking at those buildings, those buildings are pulled very close to me, made very real. Uh, and it, it's a strong idea, again, of the sensuality of the experience of mass and space. And similarly, with people standing on it, you get a, a close sense of other people's relationship on the common ground to you. And that, I think, is important because in modern design, when we're confronted with, say, doing the downtown mall or doing the piazza between some institutional buildings, as uh, commonly happens, I think that when confronted with placing that drawing on the drawing board and, and the space is defined by the buildings but there's nothing in it, the designer is, feels compelled. He's got to fill it up, put some stuff in there, make it a lively drawing, put some planters, some trees, some uh, trash cans, some seats, some fountains, 
changes of level. Uh, and while I have, of course, as we all have, been in some very nice places like that, I think at the same time they lose sight of this very strong uh, making of space which happens when the surface is very clean and very undifferentiated. Uh, that strength is reinforced in this case by the curve upwards. Uh, in a town like Trento in the north of Italy where it curves downwards is even stronger. That's unbelievable. Now take the, the surface here of these buildings. Again, we see a, a sense of curvature. Uh, we see a sense of, of, again, of coherence of the whole. The, the use of a common building material is going to give coherence through the, uh, the limited visual and constructional vocabulary that that presents. How many ways can you make a, a hole through a unit masonry wall. And you see a few ways, like the square-headed opening and the round-headed opening, but then you get pointed round, pointed arches, you get paired arches, you get squares and side rounds. So a variety is created as well. Uh, an individuality also in the some minor changes in setbacks there and minor changes in cornice lines up there. So there's a sense of coherence to the whole, but also a gentle play of distinction within the coherence. Now let's summarize some of these things. First of all, the major institutions in a town. Of working from the left, the church, and then a church administration, a council, a town hall, and a palace which may be the mayor's house or maybe the most prominent family or noble family. Uh, a big town will have two piazzas. They might overlap as they were in San Gimeno. They might be separate. A small town will have one. A small town will also probably just have the two institutions as you see on the left and on the right you schematically you have the kind of arrangement we had around that one plaza in Piazza in San Gimignano, the four institutions focused by that Piazza. And of course other permutations and combinations. Now let's, to reinforce this pattern, I want to take another study. This time Todi is further to the south in Umbria. First of all it's linear. Uh, the four, the Siding is very dominant in this big valley and because it had uh, spe special advantages, it has in fact been ha inhabited as an urban site since Etruscan times. Schematically, you see that idea again. And let's pick that up on the, on the left-hand side. So this, there we go. At the bottom building, is, you're not picking it up, I know. But the bottom building is the, I'll take the top one, that's the cathedral, the church. The bottom one is the church administration, and on the right, side by side, are the council chamber and the mayor's residence. You see also, as in San Gimignano, that there are two piazzas overlapping on that common corner. The next photographs will be on a street approaching from the bottom and also from underneath the, uh, the mayor's palace, a vaulted marketplace, looking into the main piazza. Again, the, the, the object before you is not presented at you straight away on an axial an actual relationship, but it's just slowly presented to you, unfolded, always within a space of perceptible size until you finally come into the piazza and are placed more or less on line with the church. Uh, two shots in either direction. If you take the staircase here as a common reference, you'll find it again right over on the right here. You see a common floor. You see very strong buildings sitting on this floor. And here, a lot more variation. I think uh, a wealthier town, uh, more ornamentation, slightly later buildings, but yet that common ground pulls them together. You see the emphatic forms of the Gothic institutions as they plant themselves down very securely. And also just look around, pick up the details, the play, uh, little things happening there amongst this coherence, uh, rather fun things. For instance, take this little staircase here. It comes out of that doorway and just flops onto the, the larger staircase. There is no landing, there are no stair, rail stair rails at all. A Romanesque single aisle church and later on to widen one side, there is a, as was added in the later style, the Gothic. Quite a nice space because it's only added to on one side, so you have a, a nice tension between the axiality of the single aisle church and the bias off to one side, giving you a, a sort of a diagonal effect.
And I'll start uh, another modern painter. This is the De Chirico, uh, this painting of, of 1908. He uh, is an Italian uh, parentage, born in Greece, but very much imbued with a Mediterranean tradition of towns and villages and the spaces within them. And he was, uh, his school of painting, which he called metaphysical, promoted two ideas. One, the sense of nostalgia, the infinite, enduring sense of nostalgia, but also the, uh, the visual, making visual experiences very real and insistent, especially using familiar objects. And he did a whole series of paintings using the piazza as a setting for somewhat almost uh, somber, really almost threatening kinds of atmospheres. Okay, now the gap between these two buildings is where the second piazza is. We go through to that and looking back, and there's Garibaldi on his pedestal. That's the Piazza Garibaldi. Uh, many piazzas and streets are named after him, much the same way as in the United States. You have the Washington Parks and the Washington Avenues. And from that, that piazza affords us a view out over the countryside. It gives us a chance to examine the relationship between the built form and the rural form. Here you see a degree of penetration of the planting into the town, a degree which is uncommon in Italy, which tends to have a very sharp line of distinction and exclude planting from the town. In Todi, there is a certain amount of it. And that sharp distinction manifests the, the development of the urban lifestyle. Remember I talked about the agrarian life village and the, the seeds of urbanism and a characteristic of the urban lifestyle is that it, with the development of the market economy, the uh, specialization of labor, the artisan classes, it became a very diverse kind of experience within the town fabric and a somewhat self-sufficient experience in itself. And so they, in addition to those religious reasons, uh, with the self-sufficiency to draw them in, they would turn their back on the countryside and effect a fairly distinct, clear break between the two. Staying in Todi, this picture I, is nice because I want to come down to some details. First of all, the, just the delight of the play of light across these muted shades of the uh, stonework, the coherence of that material, and all this randomness in this somewhat crude rubble. But there are some, there are some quite logical, well-organized things here. First of all, we take this line of, of stones up the middle here, and you see it is, they're big, they're well set, they're strong. Uh, on the, this side here, you see another line which has been somewhat uh, uh, intruded upon over the years. But they were the lines for the wheel traffic, and that's why they're stronger and heavier, to take the wheel traffic. On the right side of the street, you see the horizontal bands. Uh, the brickwork between is much more random work. And those steps, but they're not steps to put your foot down, put your foot on when you're climbing up and down, but rather steps over which you'll hook your heel as you move to stop yourself sliding, sliding down. This is Pienza, uh, between the other two examples in Tuscany. Now, unlike the other examples, this is a Renaissance town. But first of all, let us look at the form. You see it as a linear form, and you see major buildings in the center. Now, the plan of the piazza shows those buildings are the same four, and the, you see the cathedral opposite the town hall, and flanking it on the left, the palace of the major family, and on the right, the bishop's palace. Now, this family was, in fact, that of Pope Pius II, and it was he who transformed his birthplace, his family seat, into this what well, he wanted, a masterpiece of Renaissance town planning. And it was done by an architect, Ross, uh, Bernardo Rossellino, between 1459 and 1462. And he gave to the plan a form of the whole, and that was a gridiron. But the gridiron is bent because of the, partly because of the land form and partly it gives emphasis to the piazza. And you can see the two axes of the gridiron coming in and out of the piazza. Now, what's interesting here is that it, it reveals to us something about the, na the nature of Renaissance spirit and also the nature of formalizing. 
First of all, the kind of town that had developed up until now, the medieval town, was this somewhat organic growth, and the institutions developed in different ways in different towns and over different periods and competition, much sort of trial and error. But bit by bit, now the Renaissance designer is taking command of the whole. Now the Renaissance is the a period where man gain, regains confidence in his own human powers, and especially his, the power of the mind, the power to, to act and to do. And for him, not just one building, but the whole town becomes an object for design, and he gives a form to the whole. But, what, but the whole that he's giving a form to is the same thing which had evolved up to now. And that all those institutions, which are ones which are present in the medieval example, he hasn't changed those. He's merely given to them a formal relationship, uh, bringing them a formal relationship to the whole thing. This one's gone dead on us on this side. Can somebody just operate it by hand up there? Uh, just showing the spine road. And here's the piazza, very small, quite intimate, facing the cathedral, the two palaces on either side. You see the well, even more ornamental, quite plastic, in fact, than the one in San Gimignano, and playing off the rather stolid forms of the, of the palazzos. Now we notice the, remember the plan of the piazza, how the two sides of it were diverging away from the axis? the central axis to the cathedral. You can pick that up in the relationship of the building, the palace on the left, and how it sits on the piazza grid of the paving. The differences in the paving are a small kind of geometry which is provided. The heavy gray ones are in fact of the road which goes right through, and they're heavier, of course, to take the wheel traffic. And the, the two flanking buildings to the cathedral are splitting away and throwing one's view out beside, a very commanding view of the countryside and quite different from that more introspective one we saw in the medieval examples. Our views in the other direction, the building with the awning is the fifth institution, which every town must have, which is the local corner bar and grill. That's not the proverbial upside down slide. It's, it's rather deliberate. And I do it deliberately because I want to throw you off the actuality of what this is, which is a street and a set of doorways and some shadows. But just to look at it as a pattern of light and shadow, the different shapes to the doors, the different heights, the very, very crisp edge that's given in the harsh Mediterranean light. On the left, is a, here we see a very, very neat thing that Rossellino did. And they're creating the grid, which we're all accustomed to in, in North American towns, which is fairly strict and has long axial views. He, being aware of the quality of space that had grown in the medieval town, accomplished the same, but within the grid form. And he did this by offsetting the buildings of each block, or offsetting each block by half the width of the street. And you see the block here offset to the left, and then the next one moving slightly across to the right, and then the, the third block coming from the right and closing the view altogether. But there's still a street running straight through there with a little bit of twist, uh, stepping side to side, you take your, your axis right through. And so he progressively closes the space, co creates the closure, closure, but also establishes a sequence. And that's the quality we saw in the much more incremental forms of the med medieval examples. This is the Piazza Campidoglio. It's in Rome. And whereas all of my study is to do with small towns and villages because the forms there are much clearer, the towns being more complex, but in the, in the larger towns and cities, the basic patterns are still there. The overlapping makes them complex and less, uh, less simply perceptible. This, the city square, the town square of Rome, the Piazza Campidoglio, was designed by Michelangelo. 
and it is the center square, as a very, very celebrated example of Baroque town planning. However, you see that the, the spatial idea that he had is very similar to that of Rossellino at Pienza, and Rossellino's work predates Michelangelo's by some 70 odd years. The two drawings are to the same scale and the same orientation. And the city square is used in the same way as it is in the villages to celebrate events. This is the celebration of Rome as the capital of modern unified Italy. So it has its band, it has um, a much more uh, almost ostentatious example with, with tapestries and carpets hanging out and flags, people singing, playing Verdi. It's quite wonderful. Okay, before we move on, just want to summarize the four examples that we've looked at and their piazza relationships. The medieval on the left and the Renaissance on the right. At the top, San Gimignano, the bottom, Todi, and on the right, the Campidoglio at Pienza. Now these basic patterns of the relationship of institutions to piazzas and their situation on the hill and the relationship of the whole form to the hill are basic patterns which we find throughout the Mediterranean, but with variations according to changes in the culture and changes in the, and sometimes in the climate. So let's now go to some other regions and see what we find. Now this is the south of Italy. South of Italy was very feudal right to the 20th century. Now remember the north of Italy developed as a series of city-states, uh, merchant states with degrees of autonomy. In the south it was a kingdom, uh, the kingdom of the two Sicilies from a Norman conquest of the 11th century on and under various European houses. And so that feudal relationship was maintained. And that means that the kinds of institutions we saw in the autonomous cities of the, of the North and uh, cities in which there was the beginnings of democracy will not occur here. The same rights didn't occur because the feudal relationship was one where the nobleman, the landowner, he had the say, the whole say in what would happen. Although on occasion, uh, with the rise of, of merchant city-states, the peasants were able to compete with the landholder for some of the rights. And typically those rights would be the right to hold a market on a regular basis, the right to hold a court, the right to administer, and the right to fortify. And if those rights were granted, typically we would find that they would be manifest in the, in the urban form uh, by the building of institutions and spaces. Here you see only one building, institutional building, that of the church, the church always present. That other big one is a modern one. Uh, you don't find a wall. Uh, you don't even find a piazza, because a piazza is a place for people to gather and get common uh, strength. And the noblemen certainly didn't want that to happen. A very clear juxtaposition of the rural land to the urban land. Still in the south, on the right, uh, verba, when I speak verbally, it, it's saying uh, same, similar things that I'm saying about the spaces in San Gimignano. The sense of the coherence, you know, the sense of the individuation of uh, dwellings within that coherence. And this play of the wholeness of form against the individualizing of form is something which has attracted uh, a number of modern designers who have tried to bring it to their work. Cistanino is further south, the coast of the Taranto. This town is built on limestone, a good stone for building, and they used their technology for assembling limestone was vaulting of, of all kinds, some quite ad, ad hoc, quite marvelous. And they would vault over public spaces and over the private space of the home itself. The plan of Cistanino, very narrow streets, but the general kinds of characteristics that I was, we observed earlier. And here in the streets, you see them tight and twisting. The lady there is just uh, cleaning down her house, but however, the whitewashing uh, has become an event of social significance. Uh, two days are set aside in each year in which the community will stop whatever else they have on their mind to do and will set to and whitewash the whole town in one day, everybody working. This whitewashing tradition uh, 
found in other parts of the Mediterranean, only occasionally in Italy. It may come here from Greece by way of the foundation of this town, which was by uh, priests who were forced out of Greece in the late medieval period and came here and found it, gave a, re a religious foundation to this town. It might also uh, come from uh, the fact that the south of Italy for short periods was occupied as Spain was for long periods by Arabs, uh, Islamic people from North Africa, and they too had this whitewashing tradition. Very tight, remember as we're going further to the south, the sun is more fierce and the tightness of the streets affords greater protection from it in the midday. People have an interesting custom here that, uh, well, like most towns, the southern communities, the working day is split in two, the siesta between them. And after a heavy midday meal, people will go and sleep for a couple of hours. Before they do that, they'll take all their household garbage and simply throw it out into the street. And while they're asleep, the town cleaners will come by and clean up the whole town. So when they wake up, it's nice and clean again. In Naples, they had a similar problem with garbage in the streets. Well, they saw it as a problem, so they issued everybody with plastic bags to try and overcome the problem. So people took all their rubbish and put it in their plastic bags. And they took their plastic bags and threw them out the window. Uh, it's a nice a reversal of the usual here. Here, the, the major building becomes the figure against the white background. This is the, the city hall and the plaza in the center. Now, using the same material, only 20 kilometers away, but with a whole set of cultural differences, a different kind of building and a different kind of technology happens. These are called truly. Each one of those cones is a true low, and it, it covers one space, one room. A house made up of several spaces becomes, therefore, plural, truly. And if you want to keep on adding those spaces and adding them to make a village, and it's very simple. This town is called Alvarabello, and it's the center of that area. Now this technology, which is a dry construction, although it's rendered over at this point, but it, in its basis it's a dry construction, is not very special, other than it's very old. It's Neolithic and it's found in many places. But that it survived in this area is due to a particular political, cultural circumstance. And that is, that I talked about the, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, at one time ruled over by Spain. And a Spanish duke who occupied this particular area wanted to develop his own personal wealth and his family's strength. And so he set about uh, inviting people to come there. He wanted to pacify the countryside, so he encouraged people to settle in the countryside. And those farmhouses you saw before are very, very atypical of Italy. Like, Customarily, rural people are gathered into villages, into urban situations, and very, very seldom, other than modern dwellings, do you see them situated individually in the countryside. The second thing he did was to build his wealth, he wanted to avoid paying property tax to his king in Naples. And so whenever the tax assessor came into his region, the word would get around, and he had promoted the buildings be built in this dry form, bring up before, but it has to do with the way in which people use space outside. The, the, the street is an extension of the living room. It's used for sitting in and for, for living kinds of situations. Now, if a family's going to build a house, and they know that that's kind of part of their living environment outside, they want it not to be anonymous, but they want to establish some sense of belonging to it. So it makes sense to incline your house against the one that is next to you, and therefore create, with that physical form, some uh, imperative on that territory. On the other hand, if you're building them all in a straight line, you know very well that that would become a very anonymous space, a space in which you wouldn't feel like it was your living room. In detail, you see the, on the right, you see the relationship to uh, land form. Those streets, you can imagine them beginning as mule paths, traversing, zigzagging across the hillside itself. See a hill town in the background this painting by El Greco. I don't know, but it's probably Toledo because he lived there for a while. It 
staying in Andalusia. Again, a spine on the edge of the spine where it drops off. You see the fortification at the top. And that church you see on the right is at the foot of that castle. And the view on the right back along the spine. Spain also very feudal. It meant that it didn't develop strong piazzas until the Renaissance period, and, that, and, and only those in major cities. And the creating of some open space here, very simply a widening of the street, simple yet quite charming details, the, the uh, two, two or three steps, the line of trees, and behind that are a set of shops. And of course you notice here, with, with the trees and the flower pots, a very deliberate use of planting in the town. And that's, you find, a great deal in Spain. A balcony, a great place to have a conversation from and also a great place to observe children. Staying in the same area. Can you see on the left here in the foreground that that is a town and you see the reforms of buildings? Well, if you look right up the left-hand edge of that, you see almost a scar on the hillside in the background, but well, that's another town. A very, very rugged environment. And you might ask, well, how does that support an economy today? And the answer to that is simply, it doesn't. Many of the working population, uh, working people of the town, migrate to northern cities, either of their own country, in this case, say, to Barcelona or to Madrid, to Bilbao, to work in the big industries there, same in Italy, to Torino, Milan, or further north to Germany, France, Sweden, Switzerland. And people not just from Spain, but from all Mediterranean countries, millions upon millions of migrant workers from Turkey, uh, Yugoslavia, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, moving to these northern industrial cities. And that decision is not a community decision, very much an individual one, although at times communities are entirely deserted, villages completely left. Although there is some evidence of backflow into towns, especially in France, by young educated people. Uh, a family we knew in Sicily, there were five brothers in it, and all of them went to Germany to work at one time. Two of them decided to stay there and move their families there. The other three preferred their Sicilian style of life and decided to stay there. Uh, that particular phenomenon which has taken place since the Second World War reveals something else about the, the ingrained use of the urban fabric for socializing. Now, I talked before about the passeo, the walking in the streets, the piazza. You'll find in these northern cities, uh, and take for example Munich, a city like that because of its climate, because of its traditions of urban form, doesn't provide for that experience, the casual intercounter. And so these people will gather in a place, the best approximation, which for them is the large sort of Victorian arch, steel arched railway station. And many of these different nationalities will come together they are looking for their friends, maybe coming across somebody from their own village whom they didn't know in town. Staying in Spain, and a little further up, this is Guadalupe, but still in Andalusia, but bordering on Extremadura. Now, Extremadura is the area from which most of the conquistadors came. All those conquerors, explorers of the American continent, were from a very tight part, a small area of Spain. This town founded as, because of a miracle, a pilgrimage cathedral grew up there, and it became, in fact, the patron of much of the exploration of America. And even today, there are pilgrimages from Central and South America to this church. This is the town of Guadalupe. Okay, the view on the right is from the cathedral steps. You can use the fountain, common in both photographs. And the next series of slides will take us down through the streets, inside that portico, and on down and out of the town. town spread beneath the cathedral and spreading towards the sun. And to the north of Spain, this town is very unique because it was, has none of the economic bases I was talking about. It was in fact a medieval resort town, uh, a series of villas for the wealthy families of the nearby city of Santander. This town is called Santa Lana del Mar. If any of you are interested in prehistoric cave paintings and have heard of the caves of Altamira, this town is a mere four kilometers from Altamira. 
a beautiful town, but something about its response to natural climate, which I didn't realize until afterwards when I came to study it and prepare the drawings. First of all, let's trace the form of the town. It lies on a ridge which runs slightly to the east of north, and you see the main road taking that configuration. The houses are then are built according to social custom, up to the street, against each other, right close to the street. But then the forming of the courtyard within that does not follow the alignment given by the street, but you, you can pick up on those courtyards, how they're twisted on the diagonal so they lie due north and south, getting the breezes from the north and the sun from the south. Uh, next set of slides will take us down that, starting from the bottom, running along that street, and ending up in a Romanesque cathedral at the end. This first, remember I spoke about significance and giving significance to wealth and social position? You see on that house, as many of them have, these enormous coats of arms. Okay, now we jump to the other end of the Mediterranean, to Turkey, to southwestern Turkey. And so the spiritual leadership now is not Christianity, but it's Islam. And so we have a mosque and not a church. But let's pick up the basic form. The town runs along that ridge, and where it drops off, you see the mosque, and the orange roof is that of the major house. And then you see it on the, on the right. Uh, the town is called Dacha, and just tonight, uh, Cengiz told me that that's a Russian word and it means mansion. And whether it relates to this house or not, I really don't know. But we did find as we went there that it is quite a mansion. It is deserted because uh, since land reform uh, in the 20s and the 30s under Ataturk, the major landowners no longer have that power. And although they st may still own the house and have as they do here a caretaker, they probably seldom live there. And so we literally have squatters. This is a ceiling rosette on the left. In the same region, this town, the mosque adjoins the square, which in Turkish is the Medan. You see that the Musain no longer climbs the minaret to call the faithful to prayer, but technology has taken its place. Town, not in the valleys, but up on the ridge to catch the breezes. The houses are loosely spaced, get plenty of air, and, the, and here you see the penetration of the countryside, the olive groves running into, into the house, between the houses. This is an agrarian community. It's quite a village, not an urban community. Its, life, its, its livelihood is from the fields. Many of the people own the fields, and most of them work in fields. Uh, you don't see any sense of huddling, any sense of... Uh, of fortification. They consider that Turkey being a uh, unified country, uh, well, since primarily the 14th century and a major world empire down to the beginnings of the 20th century, was fairly stable internally. And so you don't get these series of, of fortified villages, you don't get the series of autonomous city-states developing as we saw in, in northern Italy. Again, looking at the, the central square. And you see it's not so highly developed as we saw in the European examples. And I think that has something to do with the way in which the spaces are used for celebrations, for significant events. This was, the gentleman asked me to take their photograph. We, we in fact were working our excavation very close to these people, and uh, as you as you know, Turkish people are very delightful and gentle folk. And that painting, that picture, is in no way what it might seem to be. Now, I want to show a celebration, but this time not a community one, although the community are involved. These are personal celebrations, and I spoke of those basic four before. But here I'm going to take two, namely the celebrations of adulthood, which in this case is circumcision, and the celebration of marriage. Neither of these take place in communal spaces within the urban fabric. Now this event, which is a circumcision, a senet, is 
a party. And you see, a large portion of the community are invited. And there's a great deal of celebration. There are relatives and friends, but not all the community, but they're invited to the private home. It takes place in the private home. These two boys are sons of the man on the right. Uh, it's to happen for them together, which gives it larger significance. It's also cheaper to do two at once. It's, of course, a time for great bravado as well as celebration, photograph taking. And then the ine an inevitable event must happen, and it does happen inside. But when it, when it happens, there's a fellow standing outside with a rifle, and he fires off a shot, which adv advises the rest of the village that it has happened. And so they, too, can come to the house and wish the children well. But all was not pain and agony, for these guys are getting gifts as people wish them well. In fact, they do quite well out of it. They make about 80 bucks a piece. Oops, wrong way. This is a wedding party. And this, again, not in the urban fabric or the communal fabric, but out in the fields. And here the fields are not seen as something uh, apart from uh, human social life, but very much an integral part of it. To them, a natural setting for a very significant personal and community occasion. And, and to me, the corollary of that being that not so much attention is paying to developing the spaces within the town. Got it. Now that, to me, is much an outcome of the agrarian feeling for, like, for the, to the village and for the countryside. An even more pronounced example of how the agrarian lifestyle affects land use is this example in Spain. First of all, the typical pattern, the spine, the countryside running up to the town. At the end of the spine where it drops off, In that prominent position, you see the church and the most substantial house, and in the inside of the town, you see them, again, built close to each other, a fairly uh, rudimentary kind of piazza, plaza, between them. A very poor town, uh, granite being the basic material here for almost everything. <coughs> But up on the ridge of the town, in the most dominant position, it's not for human habitation, but for the storage of the crop. Here, where the, the ventilation is best, the sun is best, is given over to the most important thing in the sustenance of that community. And here, these corn cribs, again of granite, are placed on that uh, piece of land, the agrarian economy dominating the land use pattern. Just flipping to other parts of the Mediterranean, this in Yugoslavia, it's an island off the Dalmatian coast. The town is called Kres. Here the, the central focus is, is almost the harbor itself, the, uh, the widening of the quayside forming the piazza. Uh, and the harbor is still viable, as you can see on the far right, for modern freighters has an Italian air about it, and certainly Italy has controlled it for long periods uh, the Adriatic coastlines. Uh, since Venice is a major maritime state in the medieval period, uh, right down to the Second World War, many of the older inhabitants in this town will speak Italian as a second language. And I spoke of French painters. Here are two examples from France, the one on the left in the mountains behind Marseille, and the one on the right in the mountains behind uh, Nice. <clears throat> this splendid, dramatic example is Calcutta, which is relatively close to Rome. 
And despite the dramatic nature of it, it too follows some very basic patterns. First of all, you see the two prominent buildings, the church and the village hall, are situated over the entrance to the town. <clears throat> when we look and find inside the town, we see the two, two piazzas overlapping on a common corner, a pattern we saw both in Todi and San Gimignano. <clears throat> in this form, it's almost difficult to see when a man-made form and a natural form come together, where one ends and the other begins. In fact, many of the houses have rooms, sometimes for habitation, usually for storage, excavated into the rock with windows poking out. Some of the, the little alleyways are excavated through the rock. And in fact, the entrance to the town is a tunnel approaching it from the right-hand side down that saddle. And there's a tunnel located between those two buildings. It's tunneled into the natural rock. You turn, go into it, turn to the left, rising up, and then you turn to the right to come out into the piazza. You see a man walking out there on the right-hand side. He's much wiser than I was. I took my car in, uh, which was fine, but I had great difficulty getting it out. It got stuck. Usually the green door is a common reference there. That's the church, and the building on the left is the city hall, and those two piazzas come together on that uh, curb line, paving line. Very, very tight, very small. And we turn around the other way, we just take a walk through this very fascinating place. See the staircases, the urban staircases falling into the street the uh, lifting of the, the occupied space behind the staircasing, staircase which helps to provide the privacy uh, between uh, public and private realms at close quarters. That rugged line you see at the top on the left is because that street which I'm standing in is excavated through a natural rock. The street is a living room. And while we come back to the church, <clears throat> just to remind us of how a Gothic painter perceived forms and, uh, and towns of this kind, and I think you can make your own connections between that. It's obvious that this has been a, a most delightful study for, for me, taking me to many places. Uh, this is only a small collection of a sample from the places that I have been to. But it has to be, for me, more than something which I just study. It has to be something which contributes to the way in which I look at work. And in fact, it has contributed to my work and to other people's work. And it has to do with some of the things we were talking about. We're all familiar with this kind of thing. It's not community, it's merely housing. Though it does have a central focus of community space, very symbolic, it's the parking lot. There are a couple of changes taking place in our, in our social world. We can, instead of just fitting ourselves to simple-minded zoning patterns, we do at least have the planned unit development where we can propose a development of mixed use and have it accepted on its own terms rather than plugging to a prescribed zoning pattern. We also have a condominium law which allows for individual ownership of, of, a, of a dwelling which is part of a larger structure, as well as uh, communal ownership of, of surrounding land and, and uh, shared spaces. We also have the advent of small cars. If you plan for small cars, you'll save 25% on that parking lot, maybe 30%. And so we can bring cars close to our dwellings without bringing them into that most important space, the space in between. This example in Denver is like many others in Denver. Here you see all the spaces between buildings are pedestrian. You see the use of, of the staircases, uh, the change in level, providing the privacy, although the buildings are close juxtaposition to each other. And also the angle which they are, this kind of, or in this case it's planned, but you might think of the organic angles we saw before, means that looking out of one building in an undirected glance, an undirected view, uh, because of the angle, it sort of glances our view away from the, and this is my experience, I was staying here with friends, uh, glances our view away from what might otherwise be a penetration and an intrusion to somebody else's private realm. 
I think that's quite important. Uh, no cars, just a place for people, observe from balconies. My friends there have a three-year-old son. I'm very happy to let him just go out and play without their own personal supervision. And he have made friends and it was a very rich experience for him. And think of being three, or, three years old and how important that is in the formation of, of human personality and how that would be much attenuated in an environment like we saw before. This very famous example, the Habitat Complex in Montreal by Safdie, he, in his writings about this, describes his influences from the Mediterranean tradition. He himself was, uh, grew up in Jerusalem, which of course is a Mediterranean hill town. And he was very much interested in the sense of the coherence of the whole, but the articulation of the parts within it, using here an extremely sophisticated uh, modern technology, one which perhaps got out of hand because of the vast prices that now uh, are required to rent or own these places. But you see that limited palette of materials giving the coherence, but yet the play of the individuality within the whole. When first conceived of, this was three of these blocks, and they were conceived of as community, not just housing. And also the previous example, the Denver one, has more than just housing. It has, um, it has a recreation center, has a laundromat, it has a, a child center, and has a, one commercial operation. On the left, the, the bringing of private space close to public space. And on the right, you see the arched opening, the urban staircase, the, the partial view to something unfolding beyond. All those characteristics that we were talking about before. Unfortunately, Habitat, because it has become not a space for community, in fact, it has become extremely elitist, and uh, the people who live there employ police to keep other people away. So architectural students who want to tour there, and as I think some of you will be at the end of the semester, they find it very difficult to get your photographs. But I would persist anyway. I think it's, uh, it's quite a delightful experience in terms of its scale. Of course, it is ridiculously expensive. It had something over $100,000 per unit. Another kind of community is a university college, this one by Ara Saarinen at Yale. Uh, the Yale tradition of building is medieval, but it's medieval traditional, a uh, medieval, sorry, uh, institutional, the Gothic style. And here Saarinen uses rather the traditional vernacular from the medieval. And this space between the two colleges is a street, again, the urban staircase, the, the the axis folds away to the left-hand side around that wall. You see the sharp forms and the play of shadow across them, that same kind of quality. It's interesting when you look at the plan of the whole complex to find that it's in fact a very repetitive geometry, and it's only where the two uh, parts of the complex come together that he truly creates the vernacular effect. Expanding that to a whole university community, this the New York State University at Long Island, uh, sorry, at Old Westbury on Long Island, designed by Johansson, Jaina, and Kutsmanov. A very, a very consciously, too, set out with the Mediterranean hill town tradition in mind. A very ur tight urban form sit in immediate juxtaposition with rural landscape. Inside, the staircase, the bridging across, the unfolding view, the regular shapes, the limited powers of materials, the individualization within the coherence of the whole. In this complex, there is all the activities of the university, the residential, the academic spaces, the administration, the student union. <coughs> Very much subdued within the whole, which in some ways is not like the villages we saw, was symbolic importance was given to leadership. Um, I guess, well, certainly that this was conceived of and built in the 60s, uh, a time when the relationships between the entities of the university community was very much in question and in dispute. And there is certainly here, too, a quite an experimental academic program. Cars penetrating into the space, as you would have noticed in the piazzas of the Italian examples and the Spanish examples. Uh, there is a major parking lot outside, there's a, just this limited penetration where the two, the pedestrian and the vehicle, coexist uh, without uh, forcing each other out. And certainly the European tradition in the so southern Europe is that the pedestrian has right away, but they do allow the car in. 
I haven't had the chance to design any universities, but this, a community center, I designed in upstate New York. I show it because I want to make that point about the, the sensibility of form, the material relationship to the landscape that has attracted me to the hill towns is very much a part of my own, uh, I guess, emotional makeup, my sense of feeling and visual and physical experiences. You see it as, as it's sitting very directly on a landscape which was as given before the building was there. There was a split in the level shaping width, oops, wrong one. Uh, the, the change in level in the building moves with the land. It also knits very nicely with the disposition of the activity pattern. Uh, the little staircase on the outside is quite simply the second means of egress is required from the upper level. Here's another hill town. Uh, this is Beacon Hill in Boston. It's not medieval, but it is a tradition. And uh, with an increasing amount of architects' work being involved in rehab and rest restoration and reuse, it's important that we gain an understanding of tradition and have some uh, sensibility to its forms and also an understanding of, its, of the nuts and bolts of how it was put together what makes it stand up. Oh, another kind of community. I was looking at my latest copy of Architectural Design one evening, and I was looking at this article about squatter developments in Delhi in India. And the way the graphics are rendered there at the top, just sort of open space against built space, it suddenly occurred to me that there's a configuration there, not unlike I saw in the medieval example. And a particular insight, which I think the visually educated person can have, is to you know what is behind form, has, it, has import behind just the fact that it looks a particular way. And so I began to research and find more about it and found that, that a number of architects, sociologists and geologists are beginning to study in an appreciative way the phenomena of squatter developments in the third world. Such a tremendous phenomena in a place like this, Lima in Peru, that 50% of the urban dwellers are in squatter developments. You see the kind of hillside configurations and in detail you see the, again the kinds of incremental formations that we saw in the medieval example. I think the two uh, provide interesting insights to each other. The medieval example giving us an insight into how the progressive development of these barriadas, squatter developments, and because they are developing how that progressive development might reach a stage of, of a very charming environment. And on the other hand, the barriada as a phenomena of social community processes gives us some insight into how the medieval town came into being. Now, it's important to realize that these are not slums in the sense that they aren't going anywhere. These people, in fact, migrated from the, from the countryside, lived in slums, were quite thwarted in their upward mobile and tents, and so they formed associations and forcibly seized public land and defended it and eventually founded self-help communities, which have evolved over periods of, say, 20 years uh, into dwellings in some cases which are quite well appointed, uh, almost those of middle-income, middle-class residents. And there's a whole lot more to the phenomena of squatter developments, which would take a great deal of going into it. But there are many, many positive aspects in terms of self-help community forming without reliance on the major infrastructures that we have. A resort community, this in the south of France, on the, on the plains to the west of Marseille, the dramatic form is standing out against a very flat landscape. These are other resort communities. <coughs> the one on the left was completed in the year of 1969 following literally the tradition, the one on the right being more in the spirit of safety and habitat. And this resort community, Palamas del Mar, is in Puerto Rico. You see the hill configuration, you also see the, the, the density around the harbor, much as we saw in Yugoslavia. And this also a modern resort community in Greece by Doxiadis and Associates a very sensitive use of the traditional form and also nesting very nicely with the, with the natural landscape. 
important and an area uh, of tourism and leisure where the impact of tourism is so almost gross that it destroys the sensitive environments that it went there to enjoy. The environments, both cultural environment and natural environment. Calcutta being so spectacular, is probably the most memorable of the places that I visited. I was delighted to find that not only the, the examples that have been presented to me at architecture school, the San Gimignano kind, were of this quality, but rather many, many towns were of this quality. And I think that for any of you who had the opportunity, either in formal educational circumstances or privately, to go to the Mediterranean countries and to explore them, should have that in mind and explore all kinds of towns you see in the distance. Just go look at them. You may be very surprised with what you find and develop for yourself a very personal experience, a very memorable and unique experience to you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.